Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Beatles News Brief Extra. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci, and this show is dated December 8th, 2018. Let's start with some chart news from the UK from the official charts. Dot com for December 7th through 13th on the album's top 100. The White Album is number 37, down from number 23 the previous week. And The Beatles 1 is number 93, down from number 85. On the Singles Top 100, the uh, coming back to the chart at number 62 is Wonderful Christmas Time by Paul McCartney. On the Audio Streaming 100, At number 28, back on the chart, is Happy Christmas by John and Yoko. And number 31, also back on the chart, is Wonderful Christmas Time by Paul McCartney. On the Music Video 100, uh, at number 23, up from number 24 last week, is Eight Days a Week, The Touring Years. At number 27, uh, up from number 47, is Imagine Give Me Some Truth by John and Yoko. At number 31, down from number 30, is The Beatles Anthology. And at number 37, uh, down from number 23, is The Last Waltz, which, of course, has Ringo uh, in at the very end. Uh, and on the uh, compilations, number three is Now that uh, now That's What I Call Christmas. Uh, that album features both uh, Happy Christmas and um, Wonderful Christmas Time. Two new Paul McCartney archive collection releases came out this week with remasters of Red Rose Speedway and Wildlife. We haven't had a chance to listen to everything yet, and we'll be talking more about them on future shows, but here's two early observations. Their remastered Red Rose Speedway sounds wonderful, and Live and Let Die Without the Orchestration just doesn't sound as good. On this day to remember John Lennon, contributing editor Candy Leonard, author of Beatleness, and myself, talk about what John Lennon's legacy might be in the future. This is Steve Marinucci, and I'm with Candy Leonard, the author of Beatleness. Hello, Candy. Hey, Steve. How you doing? I, you know, it seems to me that because of the album, because of the Double Fantasy album, and because of his reemergence, there was a lot of expectations on the fact that he would have been doing a lot more and 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 possibly touring and, and which Yoko has said they had been considering but what do you think Candy Yeah I think that the fact that he had just emerged you know there was the Playboy interview and those wonderful photographs mm-hmm. and the record came out and it was uh, yeah I think it actually made it more traumatic for those of us who loved him so much um it made up because we, he was right back there on our front burner again. You know, I mean, not that he, had, not that we ever stopped thinking about him, but he, he was. There was so much forward momentum in in his work and in the interviews. You know, they were out and about. They were so. Yeah, I think that it was it that it added to the uh, the shock of it. You know, and the interviews he gave were some of the you know some of the best interviews and in the and the and the Playboy interview were some of the best interviews that he had ever done. I, I mean, they yeah. were, they were you know, forceful. He had a lot to say. I haven't read the Playboy interview or the Rolling Stone interview in a long time, but I did listen to that long um, BBC World Service, uh, December 6th mm-hmm. um, interviews, a long interview. Um, I listened to it recently because I've been, you know, thinking about him and I wanted to write something. And I, I was struck by how positive he sounded and forward looking and you know talking about how he needed to get even though he had his green card he still got hassled sometimes when he traveled it was hard to travel freely because of the convict you know he needed to get his record cleared he was going to look into it and it was just he was so alive and and positive i thought i mean i I didn't hear much snarkiness i mean you know he was he was like reviewing some anecdotes and things that you know his take on you know, things that had happened in their story that people knew about. But I, I didn't hear him sounding angry then mm-hmm. in that. Uh, obviously, marriage with Yoko had helped him a lot. I mean, you could see it in the in Woman, the song Woman, mm-hmm. and that, that video is so, is so cool. So it is nice. beautiful. Mm-hmm. Where do you think they would have gone um, musically? What do you think they would have done? Now, when you say they, you're talking about the two, John and Yoko? Mm-hmm. 
I don't know. I mean, they were talking about, you know, he was in this interview, he was talking about New Wave, and he was mentioning, uh, he mentioned the Pretenders, he mentioned B-52s. That's how long ago. <laughs> These were new bands, right? Right. Um, um, I think they might have gone in sort of a punk disco, I think was the was where it was going then, you know, like club music maybe. Um, now, I, I, you know, the, the one song that I look at that is probably the key to the whole thing is Walking on Thin Ice. Yeah. I think they would have they would have gone in that direction. I think they would have been very experimental. And in fact, um, I believe I asked Yoko about that in one of the times I interviewed her and, and she kind of said the same thing. Although, obviously, I mean, there's no way of knowing what, exactly what they would have done. Yeah, I mean, she might have wanted to go back to doing, you know, different kind of art, and he might have gotten a band together. I mean, we, we just don't know, you know. I mean, it's it's kind of, it's, we, who knows? You know? Well, I mean, they did they did perform together, right. uh, you know, at Madison Square Garden, and, the, and there was talk that, I mean, there have been stories over the years that they would have, or there was consideration that they would tour, mm -hmm. and and there was even consideration that he would perform a couple of Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. Wow! And he and he was not against performing Beatles songs. He he you know he did perform them with Elton John that right. night, that night. So yeah, I wouldn't expect him to be. I mean, he might denounce you know have denounced them on that on his first album, but you know he. I don't think he would be averse. Would have. I mean, it makes sense to me that he would feel fine about doing Beatles songs. And it and it would have been really kind of um, interesting to see where he would have gone, say today. Um, yeah, I mean, who knows? You know, I mean, it's it's so hard to contemplate you know i mean he also might have gotten you know done more painting or drawing or write you know, who it it's uh you know the amazing thing it's been so long right it's it's like it, you know it's going on to four decades um and yet it's still so raw you know it still feels so uh shocking right, right? Brian, when I talked to Brian Southall, the uh, journalist, he, uh, it was his opinion that John would have mellowed. And I think that's probably somewhat true. I mean, McCartney has mellowed a little bit. Well, people mellow with age, you know, like wine and fruit and cheese, you know. <laughs> right, and, and Ringo has, has somewhat mellowed, uh, too. And I think they all would have, uh, you know... Uh, it would have been it would have been fun to see what would have happened. Yeah, I mean, I think you know John was easily bored. He he always wanted to be doing something. I mean, he liked sitting around doing nothing, but he also you know he was restless and he had a drive to express himself. And I think that uh, he would have been doing that in in some way, probably music. Um, I mean, I always wonder about his political activity. Would he have been? You know, would he have been involved in the no nukes movement or, or, you know, things like that, you know? And then I think, well, today, my God, like, what would he be saying about the rise of fascism in, in Europe today or or Trump, you know? Like, I, it's just hard to imagine him as a presence in the world today uh, looking at these things, you know? Yeah, I mean, there was that. There was that theory of several years ago that he would have turned conservative, which I think is a, you know, ridiculous idea. He would. Well, is that based on the, the belief that people with is it that when people get older, or because he was so wealthy? No, there was there was some other there was some other um, thing to latch onto, and I can't remember what it was. It it was it was so it was such a ridiculous idea, though. And and there was just no way, uh, especially given Yoko. I mean, I can't see him turning conservative and and Yoko going along with it. Especially, I mean, that right. would have been that would have been very interesting to see the two of them together. Well, one of the things that they had in common was that you know they were both affected by the war, by World War Two in different ways, and and they both, you know, the, this 
you know, the, the anti-war piece was very strong in each of them. And so when they got together, I think there was a synergy there and, and you know, they that became their thing. And, and, you know, John, I think, recognized that he was in a truly historically unique position as somebody who could, who had this never before big, you know, platform bigger than anybody ever had, really. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, with millions of young people around the world uh, hanging on his every word. And, and he would, you know, the, he, he didn't sign on for this, but it kind of happened and he realized it. And I think that, again, I always refer people back to that December 66 Look Magazine interview. I feel like it's so informative about who John was then and really foreshadows a lot that happened after. And he really in the years from, say, 66 to 80, he really kind of turned around somewhat in the way he looked at the world and looked at, you know, his fellow human beings, right? Right. Well, particularly women. I mean, he, you know, Yoko, uh, through their discussions about art and music, uh, life, peace, war, or just spending time with her, you know, he, he never knew a woman like that who was an equal, and I, you know, who he respected as an equal, and I think that that really, plus she was a feminist, and, you know, struggled with a lot of, um, you know, misogyny in the New York art world and all this, you know, she'd been used to sort of, you know, dealing in, in male systems and whatnot, so she was a full-blown feminist, and she uh, imparted that to him in a really genuine way. I mean, I think he really had an epiphany, you know, had a series of epiphanies in his time with her. And, well, you can hear it in, in the song, you know, Woman is the, now we have to say, Woman is the N-word of the world. And also in uh, Power to the People, there's also a verse about women. So, you know, in this interview, this BBC interview, he talks a lot of, you know, they talk about their relationship and this and that. And, and she she talks about what we would now call, she didn't use this term, but what we would now call microaggressions about, you know, like, why does he have to read the newspaper first? Like, I pick up the newspaper, it comes, and I want to read the paper. It's like I'm not allowed to because the man has to read the newspaper first. You know, mm-hmm. so, so they were really working on these issues, you know. I mean, well, even, I mean, even before that, I mean, when... Um, uh, I just saw Peter Asher's show with Jeremy Clyde over the weekend, and he plays a clip where he ta- he tells how he uh, helped bring John and Yoko together because they met at the Indica Gallery, which right. was he was part owner of. And John's he plays a clip from John, and John says that when he saw the the sign at the top of the ladder that said yes, that got to him that that yeah. that that attracted him he said if it had said no or if it had said almost anything else i probably would have just gone right. gone away you know walked out of the the gallery and you know n- and would have not connected with her but right. because of the positiveness of that yes Right. That's well, what it, he also that's what recognized him. the kindred spirit. You know, she was a little flaky in the way that he was. You mm-hmm. know, so they were and that po- they saw something in each other that was and, apparently very special. And that positiveness, ha- she has held on to that. Yes, she's a, she's a very for all the you know for all the things that people criticize her for. I mean, they you know the first thing you talk you know people will criticize her music they'll criticize they'll say you know she's you know a dragon lady she broke up the beatles you know you hear you see still see these ridiculous ideas you know sometimes uh, on facebook she's always been very positive mm-hmm. and and that and that in itself you know is is something that that uh, i mean it goes along with the beatles whole love you know the idea that all you need is love. Mm-hmm. She and she's she's been there. She's been all in on that from day one. How do you think he'll be remembered? You know, fifty, thirty, forty, fifty, hundred years from now. Well, it'll either be through the symbolic pictures, like the uh, the Bob Gruen shot of him doing the peace sign, uh-huh. or or again the the music. I mean, if imagine with the way they 
they uh, reworked uh, the Imagine album in the box set that just came out. Um, I think there's that possibility. There's, you know, there's all sorts of the music. I think will is what will live on. Yeah. That's really that's really all what there is. So I think he, you know I I think he was such an important figure in you know post war American history. I really do, and I, I mean I think that he. He was he was very significant, and I would hope that in the future that you know people would still know about him. You know, because I mean, obviously the music, of course, but even beyond that, you know, the, to see how impactful not only you know all of them, but he in his own particular way. So but I don't think you know, I don't no. I don't I don't think that's going to be a problem. I really don't. Thank you, Candy. Thank you, Steve. Also on this date in history, on December 8, 1966, the Beatles worked on Strawberry Fields Forever and Paul McCartney overdubbed his lead vocal for When I'm 64. On December 9, 1961, the Beatles performed for only 18 people at the Palais Ballroom in Aldershot, England. On December 9, 1992, George Harrison received the first Billboard Century Award that was presented to him by... Tom Petty at the third Billboard Music Awards. Happy birthday on December 9th to Neil Ennis, who you'll know from the Bonzo Dog Band, who performed in Magical Mystery Tour, and also from the Ruddles. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com or on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please join our Beatles News and Information group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world and check out our That's What I Want Beatles store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or your favorite people. We hope you'll look for our next show, which you can get the easiest way by subscribing, and we hope you will subscribe. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you. that one market fab <laughs>